Okay, can everyone hear? So I cannot remember a time in our family before HD. Uh, my earliest memories are visiting my grandparents on a Sunday and um, my grandfather sitting in a chair in his shirt and tie because it was Sunday and very rarely getting out of it, probably because there was eight of us and he'd probably trip over one of us. Um, but it's always been there. Now we emigrated before his disease progressed too far. So personally, I didn't see much of the the end uh, part, the last 20 years of his life. And uh, we migrated in 1970. But in, 19, in 1991, I think it was, my parents went back to um, Holland and um, some of her sisters who had watched the progression of the disease saw the early markers for my mum. You know, up until then we we tried to excuse everything with she's clumsy, she's tired, she's change of life, it's everything. We found every excuse under the book to not have to use the Huntington's word because of what it would mean for us. So after that we couldn't um, we couldn't deny it any longer and then all of us, eight of us, started simply watching ourselves and the others, uh, you know, and, um, but without ever speaking about it because to us nobody really spoke about it. We all knew it was there and we spoke about it very superficially but we were always concerned about the career impact that HD or the knowledge that HD was in our family would have. A lot of my sisters and brothers had had careers that um, may not have progressed as well if their bosses or companies had known that they were HD positive or, or that they, there was Huntington's in the family even. So it was kind of this shameful secret that um, we spoke about to a certain extent. In 1993 testing became available. Being the analytical person that I am, I decided I needed the test straight away so I could plan my future. And I was the only one who did for many, many years. Luckily, I had a, a negative result that was that didn't come out with, with the joyous experience that I thought it would be. Uh, it's a lot to process whether you're negative or positive. And um, caused some conflict between members of the family, other siblings who, who felt, even though on a, on a, on a we knew technically that everybody had a 50% chance, but somebody else getting a negative still made the others feel as though it might be, it's more likely to be them. So it wasn't until 2006 that a couple of my sisters went and got tested and they found out they had the, that they were both gene positive. Now nobody spoke about it. They didn't tell us they were testing, they didn't tell us the results. Uh, until 2013, at my mother's deathbed in the last week when she was in palliative care, they both admitted that they too um, had um, Huntington's disease. Now at that stage we had, we had known but never spoken openly about it because we saw their careers fall apart. And um, one of my sisters subsequently got sacked from Rubina Hospital for being drunk on the job. And she would not admit to anybody that she had Huntington's and that's still something we have to correct on their records. So my mum and well, even my grandfather, they all had very different journeys. My grandfather stayed at home, lived in a fairly small place with lots of um, children and, and sons and daughters-in-law to help my grandmother with the, the care. So he was able to stay home right to the end. Um, my, my mother was at home for many years until my father developed cancer and she had to go into a nursing home. So she spent seven years in a nursing home, the last three of which in a, in a fallout chair so she, wouldn't, she, so she would be safe, but with my dad visiting her every single day. Um, it was better than we could have hoped for. It was a good nursing home, but seeing the, the differences now with the NDIS, you know, I wish she could have been around to have that level of care. So out of my two sisters, they're very, very different. And that's one thing I have learned. You can't, you can't um, impose what you think is the best thing on your family member with HD. 
they were different before, they have different ways that they wanted to live before and they will have different requests, not, not necessarily wanting to live what you think has been, is the best way to survive. And Tressa and Lauren have helped us come to that conclusion <laughs> and uh, accepted the fact that they wanted to live life on their terms, not what we thought would be best for them. So one of my sisters was married for 30 years to a man 30 years her junior, uh, her senior, sorry, sorry, her senior. So he had, he, had, um, he had worked in the coal mines back many years ago in Scotland and had emphysema and lung problems as a result. And so he tried his best to modify the house, you know, with his walker, with his toolbox underneath the seat of his walker and uh, <laughs> modified the house so they could stay there as long as possible. Um, but when the time came that she started to become symptomatic, this is after she lost a job for being drunk on the job, um, they weren't able to manage the house and her beloved garden the way she would like. And then came that transition period where I think there was a lot of shame attached to the fact that they couldn't manage. And there's a denial about that you really do have symptoms, you know, like I've always been clumsy, I've never liked cooking. There's all the stories that come with it. And when we signed her up to the NDIS the first time, I had people come to the house. She didn't get accepted because from the way she told her story, they were managing fine. So the next time I had to go along as well and be a little bit more honest and about the sort of help that they needed. But it was hard for them to help, to accept help because of the shame they had been very, very proud housekeepers and gardeners and it had been let slide because they did the best they could but couldn't really manage. So it was really, really hard for them to accept help even when the NDIS package was arranged. It took probably a year and a half before they accepted help and that was only when they were in hospital about to get put into a nursing home. That's when they finally accepted help. Up until then, we'd had a support come, a worker come once a week to get groceries and bring food but she was never allowed past the threshold. She was working from the veranda <laughs> so, because I don't think they wanted her to see the inside of the house. So my brother-in-law ended up in hospital with um, lung cancer and my sister had to be admitted with her for social reasons. She couldn't manage on her own. And we tried to get them to work with a social worker to see if she could, they could both stay there until we got the right service in place, which was only a matter of weeks. We reckon four to six weeks to get a service um, agency in place to look after them at home and to clean up the house and sort everything out. Um, the hospital wouldn't do that. They dis they, as soon as he was medically fit, they discharged them both and they were back 48 hours later. Then 48 hours up, turned into another six or seven weeks and we had trouble, even when we had a service provider, we had trouble getting them out of there because they thought, because of his age and her uh, Huntington, that they should both be in a nursing home. So we worked, during the period of this time, we had six different social workers across two hospitals and not many of them understand what's available through the NDIS. And while they're all very well-meaning, it's hard for them to use their imagination to see what could be possible. We even had somebody say, but I know somebody who was more eligible for NDIS than your sister and they ended up in a nursing home. Therefore, you know, she assumed so should my sister and her husband. We managed to get them home out of hospital with a support service and it lasted four months until he passed away from lung cancer and she passed away two weeks later, but from a heart attack. And, but they had lived that four months exactly as they wanted. In their house, 24 hour wraparound support in their own home. She was able to see him right through the end and he was able to keep going until he knew she had a secure service that would see her through. So, and that four months was so, we had a different person. We, our, our sister came back, her daughter was able to speak to her on the phone. The anxiety was gone because they were secure and settled. No longer were they worried when they had a fall that they couldn't call the ambulance because they might take them to a nursing home. So the NDIS for them, while it took a, a lot to get them to accept it, it was really, really helpful. Mother's sister has been a whole different kettle of fish. She was never married. 
Probably Huntington's had something to do with that. Never had any children. And um, she ended up living with me for a year when, um, when she first became homeless, which is when she could no longer manage her finances and pay her rent and do all of those sorts of things anymore. That was a difficult year where I think I would have jumped off a veranda railing or something like that and I've got a very high house if it hadn't been for Tressa and I think it was Christine at the time, it was pre-Laura, because that was chaotic. Um, with her struggling to accept that this was Huntington's, not something else and um, yeah, she was, her, her symptoms were very, very different. Um, she had a very different personality pre-Huntington's as well. So she ended up leaving my place because all my visitors were spying on her and went through various stages of um, skirting on the edge of homelessness until a fall ended up, uh, she ended up in hospital after a fall in, I think it was, 2018. After that, there w she, she was not, the NDIS hadn't really started properly in Brisbane where she was and she ended up uh, in a nursing home where she spent two years and it was a, it was, it caused many, many sleepless nights for the rest of the family. Within a few, a few weeks she was in a locked dementia ward because she tried to go for a walk. She became totally non-verbal, there was very few people there that spoke English and nobody really spoke to her. They were too time poor. Um, and in the last 12 months there, it was about two years in total, in the last 12 months, at the peak times of, of well, the peak um, public holiday time, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, and the day before Good Friday, which was her birthday, she was sent to hospital with urinary tract infections uh, because it was easier for them to manage over the, the public holiday weekends without her there. Um, I even had a, a very senior staff member from the nursing home, I don't know her title, director of nursing, whatever it was, but she said to me that she felt that while her, in, during her time in hospital she had learnt consequences because where she used to sometimes act out when she was frustrated, now she was quiet and she sat in her chair while she was medicated. <laughs> she hadn't learnt anything. She wasn't capable of learning consequences at that stage. So it was... It was her birthday on Good Friday 2019 when they put her out for the last time and refused to take her back and she ended up in Prince Alexand yeah, PA Hospital for until April the 3rd the following year. So um, during that time she was in her room, she went out for a walk around the corridor a couple of times a day and she went outside tw twice during that time, once to have a picnic on the front lawn and which you know they we did we were allowed to do under their watchful eye and once to attend the HD clinic and that was it. Now she didn't respond very well to that, obviously. A different special on every day. So her behaviours, which were situational, got quite severe. That was made it difficult for us to find a service provider to give her support through the NDIS, which had we had put in place and we had approval for, but we couldn't find a provider because her symptoms during the hospital and the, the, the uh, reports written about her made her sound like a wild animal and people were frightened to take it on. We finally did take, find a service that took, it, took her on and she now has two people round the clock, 24 hours a day. One is at night time, one is asleep and one is awake. There's someone in her bedroom in case she tries to get up during the night or because she, she's up all times of day and night and, and might fall or something. But she is having the best years of her life for, for probably the last two decades. She is out every day, theme parks, she goes to musicals, they hire costumes to go to the ABBA concert. Those sorts of things is what she's doing and she's directing what it is that she wants to do. And the difference it has made to her life and to ours because we no longer have to lie awake at night, turning up in September that year to, finding, to find her handcuffed to the bed and sedated from September to April. It was only really th because of COVID that we got pushed through quickly to get her out of the hospital. So that's one side benefit of COVID. 
So what we found was it's very, very difficult. It has been, it's starting to change according to the latest ABC report from a couple of weeks ago. But it's very difficult to come from the hospital system to the health system, uh, to the NDIS system. You're not allowed to have an OT from the NDIS come and assess the patient while they're in hospital. They have their own people. Their own people don't understand Huntington's though and don't understand what's available through the NDIS, although I'm told that's changed in the last year or so or is in the process of. But that's been the biggest hurdle. Now, my older sister and I have done most of this together. Now, I've had many years of experience dealing with child safety professionally and, and also, you know, the, the uh, community services sector. And my sister was at director level in public service. We, we struggled to get them out of there and stay sane. What I can see now is, is that you know that we need to build a bridge between the health system and the and the disability system. That's the real difficult thing. And for a for a um, person with Huntington's, it's really really difficult to navigate. Well, even a family to, that supports a person with Huntington's, it is really hard to navigate that um, that time that transitional period when they're going into a twenty four hour care or when they can accept the care. There's so many hurdles, some put up by the client, by your family member, and some put up by bureaucracy. So, you know, having done this, we feel now, my, I have one sister who's passed away, and the other one is in a really great spot. We feel like now we're in a position where we can offer some support to people who want to know, you know, how did you do this, how did you do that? And we're also working on a... On a um, providing a transitional model so that people can stay in a transitional accommodation while they apply, while they search for their uh, permanent option. So, in summary, yeah, what the things that we've really, really learnt is that no two people with Huntington's disease are the same and they don't need the same type of care. I had two sisters. They didn't like each other before HD. They didn't like each other with, when they got HD. There was a lot of people who put pressure on us to put them in a house together. <laughs> because, you know, HD goes with HD. In fact, the day I dropped her to the aged care centre, I got in, uh, we, we came up the corridor with the uh, lady who ran the place and said, oh, this is so-and-so, our other client with HD. And I said, oh, do you introduce everybody by their disease or just the Huntington's people? You know, it was, it was people just assumed that they're all the same. But we weren't the same before, they wouldn't be the same after. Um, so look for a research and look for a model of care that works for that individual and don't take no for an answer. They will, everybody will tell you, the professionals in the healthcare sector will tell you, this is what happens next, that's what happens next. And because that's what they're used to doing, that's what their systems are set up to do. And, you know, in Queensland, the NDIS is still only five years old. There's still a lot of people who don't know the system. Um, they don't understand the type of supports that are available through NDIS. So do your research and don't take no for an answer. Change is slow is something we worked at, we, we've learned. And we found that once you get a support service, work collaboratively with, with the support staff. They won't get it right first off. We were told by the support service that supports my sister that we will go through a lot of staff at the beginning because some people will work, you know, and they won't be a good fit and they'll move them on until they get the right fit. And it took a few months. And even then, a lot of them came from the older model where, where clients were kept clean, and safe and well fed and they did that extremely well um, but they they were not yet at the place where the individualised support is today where people's personalities and interests are recognised and really catered to so but to remember that these we're all on a journey learning how all this works including the support staff and it's very very important to make sure that they feel that they don't feel criticised for their job. So we've it took nearly six months 
till we're at a place now that I felt if something happened to me and my, sis my other sister who supports me to support Femi, it, it, um, we're at a place now if we, we could both go overseas at the same time and we wouldn't lose sleep. And that's taken a long time. We've been two decades helping our family through this, you know, through the difficult parts of the disease. But we now feel we're at that point. And that is because of the way the NDIS is supporting my sister. And I know there's many people struggling, but I think that the key really is to work with those support staff so that they they too feel valued and that they come on the journey to learn about your sister. You know, when they dressed her in track suits and had her hair and pigtails, we showed her pictures of her 40th birthday party where she was in, uh, oh, I think it was a... Chanel? <laughs> it, was, um, it was a stripper party, so, <laughs> you know, and she had coloured hair and that sort of thing. When they started to realise, ah, this is who she is, um, there was a person before HD, she had a life, she had an, a personality, she, she, she n never wore a tracksuit in her life. So, you know, they then went on a quest first to buy her a mirror and to buy nice clothes and with our help and support. And now we don't have to do that for them anymore or with them. They know what she likes and, and they take her to shops where they know she'll pick what she likes. So it's been absolutely wonderful to see that and to now be able to visit her as her sister. We no longer have to visit her to, to sort out her care. This Christmas will be the first Christmas that my other sister who lives in Canberra and does a lot of the support remotely will be the first time in 25 years that she'll be coming to Queensland as a holiday, not longer to sort out a crisis because our lives have been crisis for many, many years. But we're past that now. so. Thank goodness for the NDIS. So that's all I've got. Has anybody got any questions? <laughs>